Welcome to the Cosmo United Baptist Church. We're glad you're here and invoke God's blessings upon you as you share in this time of worship with us. In the course of next Sunday, we will have a baptism service for this year. One of us is being baptized. But during that time, we'll also share. And I invite you to invite as many of those people as you know who feel life is not worth the living. How can I explain so much trouble going on, personal or collective or public? Innocent babies dying and so much. Where is going all this? Those are puzzles like that. <coughs> Let's invite them. We'll be addressing those issues. But for today, we are in John's Gospel and chapter 8. And let's read that 8th verse again. Jesus said to the man, Do you want to be healed? Get up. Take your bed. Walk. I just want to think that all of us want to be helpful. All of us want to be a blessing to other people. And it hurts when you can meet with some people who say about you, you mean nothing to me. I don't find anything in you. And we know that some of us grapple with such difficulties. Am I worth anything at all? Of what value am I? Others of us perhaps have been told, you're just useless. And that's not nice to be told like that. We feel like we are underachievers. Is our life really of any worth? We begin to wonder. The text before us brings us to a place where we can feel very comfortable. The world is looking at what have you done, what have you achieved, what are you able to give, how much power do you have, what is your strength like, are you above weakness, do you really have something to show for who you really are? But we're dealing with a God who is saying, I'm looking for the weak, I'm looking for the sick, I'm looking for the dirty, I'm looking for the nothings, I want to take away their filth, I want to take away their weakness, I want to take away their worthlessness, I want to take away everything destitute about them. I want to put something that is eternally worthwhile in them. What a difference from our viewpoint of view and that of God's. And I want to ask that you who come to listen to what God's word has to say to you in the course of this morning, we just drink in what your God has to say. And that's what's good for us to begin, just where Jesus himself is. For Jesus is the one who speaks. He said to him, he said to the sick man. And see the sense of expectation. We read in our text that this man had gone to this pool in the hope that when the water is troubled, he would be the first to get there. So he simply has a sense of expectation. He's looking for something. And uh, with that, see how there might be some excitement in the whole thing. Because to think he's going to get over his illness, who wouldn't be glad about such a situation as that? The hope is I can get there. So you can well see the energy that is driving him, the delight, the prospect of just getting there, ahead of the others, even though he's been trying for endless years, he will not give up because this is the only hope he has. But now notice that it has all failed. Here is a situation in which the Savior appears. And there is change, there's a change of expression here. The man no longer can look at himself. He's, it's the expression of the one who appears before him. For this Christ has not only seen, but also understood 
this man to have been sick a long time. So the very appearance of Jesus must have an appeal about it, which as yet the man doesn't know of, which you can relate to what has gone in the chapter before. The woman at the well comes to draw water, and the Lord says, give me a drink. And then the woman says, uh, we come to draw water here. And uh, do you, a Jew, ask me to give you a Samaritan water? We don't relate. The Lord says, if you knew who was speaking to you, you'd ask him and he'll give you living water. And the Lord, you have nothing to draw with, you know, how can... The Lord says, I am the well. You see, so the wellspring of life, the wellspring of health, the wellspring of happiness, this is the expression that this man can see in Jesus, and yet he can't put a finger on it, because as yet his eyes have not been opened. He doesn't know who it is that is speaking to him, but the expression certainly is there. There is this sense, something is about to be here. What is it? It's the exclusiveness of Jesus. For this Jesus who speaks to him, is speaking to him as one who has the ability that no one else has. So when Jesus comes to speak, it's synonymous, it's like the breath of God that brings life into his soul. That was given to us in Genesis 2-7, when God breathed into the lifeless body of Adam, and then it became a living soul. For God's word is such as brings life when we hear it and take it in, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that springs from the mouth of God. And that way you are exposed to in the course of this morning. And I pray that you will be the one who this very day lives before God. For for this very reason you came. And so I ask, what is your weakness in the course of today as you sit there? Which you, that which you know has actually eaten you up and defeated you. What effort have you made to get out of that weakness? What have you re received in return for the effort you've put in? Who else has come to help you along, to come alongside you and help you get over that? Where has that taken you? Do you realize in the course of this service You've just been exposed to the answer you've been looking for to get out of that weakness, to get out of that situation. This is exactly what Jesus is telling this man who is before him. Here is the end of your trouble. And to prove that, we not only see Jesus as the one who speaks, we see Jesus as the healer. Because he says to this man, get up. He says to him, rise. When Jesus says rise, means you're whole. You're no longer unwell. You're actually now healed. Get up. You can see how this man must be surprised. 38 years he has been an invalid, altogether important. And now he should be told, rise. He must pinch himself. Is he really rise? The one who speaks, as we said, is one who knows what he's talking about. Minces no words. Knows his ability. And so knows what he's able to achieve. So the woman says, you rise. He means you rise. It's a question of listening. Has this man listened? Has this man understood the instruction? And has this man drunk it in? Or is it just saying, am I dreaming? And you leave it there. I was listening to a story of a lady who went to the States after hearing that there was a possibility, just a possibility, 
of uh, MS being treated there. And as we know, there's no treatment for that. But she said, they said there was a possibility. So I went because I heard there was a possibility. Instead of just sitting back and lying down waiting to die, there's a possibility, a maximum of that possibility. And according to her, she came back better. The testimony of people that had spoken helped her go and find what made her feel better. Psychological or real, she felt better. When you go before your medical doctor, isn't that what you're expecting? When you say, doctor, here am I. You want him to see. And you want him to check you out. If he just looks at you and says, okay, you are unwell? All right, go and drink Tylenol. Uh, whether or not he means business, if he says, okay, open your mouth, um, put the stethoscope around, and the screen goes down, then thinks a little, yeah, he, said, he examined me. The very idea that you asked questions, did what he could, tried to dig out what the problem was, that was consoling. He took some time to find out what was wrong and therefore to diagnose a right my illness that he may prescribe the right remedy. He is a good doctor. My doctor is good. And we'd like to feel that our doctor is good. He is a by far better doctor who when he sees, he feels compassion towards you, he feels with you, and he doesn't just feel with you. He wants to act for you. Act for you in a manner that says, let's get over with the problem. That is what Jesus is saying to this man. And the question is, will he buy into it? Or will you buy into it? For as Jesus looks at each one of us here, he comes with understanding. I know all about you, and I know more than you know. If you didn't know that, understand it now. A healer must know like that, otherwise you won't heal. A help must not be like that, because if the help is weaker than I am, less knowledgeable than I am, I don't know how much of a help it's going to be. But if it's above me, more promising, then I know it's dependable. And the Christ about whom we are talking is the Lord, not of some creation, but of all creation. By his hand, it was created. And when anything goes wrong, he knows exactly what has gone wrong. So when he says, get up, he means, get up. Well, will you? Well, look at the last thought. We see Jesus as Savior. In his healing, he not only makes right, he delivers the whole person. That's what he does. I want you to observe that when he says to this gentleman, pick up your mat, and walk. He is saying, I have done my part. I have touched you. Now you do your part. Act on what I've brought out to you. Take up your mat and walk. Do you have a problem? Do you have a worry? Do you have a concern? Do you, are you faced with a difficulty? What is it? Does it overwhelm you? Is your marriage failing? Is it your relationship with your parents? Are you a problem child? Well, do you feel to get on with 
people relationally? Do you find that your worries are such as you just never get over them? Is it an illness that you're faced with? What is the problem that is knowing at your soul? Is it a weakness? You're always doing wrong and you know we have a habit that you just can't break. What is going on with your life? The text is telling us, the Savior says, do you want to get over that? Here I am to deliver you. And if you trust me, you are over that. So get over that. Because I, the deliverer, say, in my strength, you get over it. The test is simply this. Will I keep on looking at my weakness, at my worries, instead of looking at my deliverer? I'll say, I've been drinking the bottle. I've been at the bottle for too long. How can I stop today? This has been the area of my failure for years. How can I stop today? You see, this thing has been there for countless times, endless years. Who doesn't know? For the Bible tells us Jesus saw and Jesus understood. So you're not saying anything, you're not experiencing anything that he's unaware of. You're not going to say to him and he says, oh, I didn't know that. He knows it all. And so when he says to you, you get up, pick up your mat, walk. He means just that. But will you trust? Oh no, the, the, the smoke has just overwhelmed me. I smoke even in my dreams. That may be. But he's saying, this is the end of your weakness. This is the end of your failure. Will you trust me? Oh, you just don't know what you're talking about. If you knew how, how, how this thing has taken over me. And that's why Jesus says, he who, is a who does something is a slave to what he does. I'm not a slave. And because I'm not a slave, I'm a free son. If I make you free, you will be free indeed. So will you come to the freedom that is given? Or will you stick to your personal cries and keep on grumbling and they're being disgruntled when the answer is there. Oh, you know, I've been ill. I've seen so many doctors and uh, it, it doesn't work. Well, God wants to use them to heal you. So will you keep on looking at the illness, at the weakness, instead of looking at the Savior, the Redeemer, the help that doesn't fail? That's the challenge I could give you in the course of today. You, are, you listen to him, you hear him heal you, and you sense that he has actually done it, and you prove it by acting on it. I may further take this, even in our attitude towards ourselves. Many of us, you know, seated here, if I said to you, when did you last talk to a friend about Jesus? Talk to a friend about Jesus, I don't have the gift. David told us that when she was a little girl, what happened? She accepted Jesus into her life. How is it that she's not keeping quiet about it? Because he touched her and healed her. And now she go, she's got up and what is she doing? She's walking. Most of what we find difficult is because we end up listening, reasoning our way and not acting God's way. If we act upon it, will be surprised. Try it. Just after leaving this room and say to your friend, are you coming to church with me next week? What? Go to church with you? <laughs> you have made a start. You'll be surprised that God will follow after that. It's failure to act upon. He, says, he doesn't say, get up, stand still. How many of us here have had knee replacement, uh, uh, elbow replacement, or an operation? Why do we go to rehab? To exercise the healing that is taking place. Because if you stay without exercising, what you don't use, you what? Yes. There you are. You want to lose what good things God has planted in you, shut up and keep quiet. 
Why is the mom blind? When it has eyes, it has gone underground forever and so has lost its sight. So you begin losing your abilities because you are not using them. When God speaks and says you're healed, and say, give me the signs. And what I can't, in you I can. That's what he's calling us to do. I can't remember this story too well. But the first youth conference I attended when I came to Canada, one of the speakers said, if I get the story correct, that an African man had come to visit in one of the zoos here. And then he actually noticed there was an impala, something like a deer. And in the wild, this animal can leap up to 30 feet high. But he noticed that this animal was actually just in a fence, no higher than our pews here. And it did not jump over. And he said to himself, why? These animals can leap. How is it that they're just in that enclosure? And the man taking the animal says, from the time they were born, they are kept within, and they knew that this was the boundary between the outside and themselves. So they never excite their muscles, and they can't live beyond that. They have been tamed. How would they succeed? They need to go out in the world, run, run, learn how to run away from the lion, then they'll leap. But rather than that security, they want. What are you afraid of? Why are you failing to leap over your fears, leap over your illness, leap over your sins, leap over your failure, leap over anything else? When there is a God who says, I am the one that gives you the ability to live, rise, get up, walk. Will you?